Hello, I'm Herzog, and I'm here to talk about my favorite alternate history scenario of all time, Kaiserreich. Of course, a scenario this good wasn't made by me. It's a mod for Hearts of Iron 4, and this mod creates a world where the Central Powers had won World War 1. In these next two videos, I will be explaining the Kaiserreich timeline, which takes place from 1917 to 1935. If you watch this video and you become interested in the mod Kaiserreich, or just the lore in general, I will link the Ahoy Forum mod in the description below so you can play it and download it for yourself. Of course, you need Hearts of Iron 4 to play it, but... And Steam, so you can't pirate it. So, uh, just don't be a jerk with getting it, and then you, you'll be fine. The divergence point between the Kaiserreich timeline and ours starts in 1917, where the Kaiser, Wilhelm II, is hearing arguments from the military to start unrestricted submarine warfare. William dismisses both of them in this new timeline, which prevents the Americans from entering the war. History stays similar from this point. French soldiers strike, the Germans recover, and the Russian Civil War happens. Then, the Austrians become less incompetent for once, and they launch the Caporetto Offensive, where they push the Italian forces back to the Piave River, but the Italians finally stop the Austrians and prevent them from taking Venice. Meanwhile, in Arabia, the Ottomans are just getting ripped to shreds by the British, with the British capturing the city of Baghdad in today's Iraq, and the city of Jerusalem in today's is- I mean, pal- I mean, Botswana? Oh, th th that's fine? Okay. The year of 1917 is closed off with a British submarine destroying a ship sending Christmas gifts to the Germans, which is essentially the equivalent of being a bad sequel to The Grinch Stole Christmas. The British obviously apologize after the public forces them to, and they lessen the blockade, which puts to bed the idea of a famine for Germany, but the Germans are still pretty starved. 1918 starts off with the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which gives Germany huge swaths of land in the east and puts Russia out of the war. The Allies try to destroy the German line in the west, but this goes extremely horribly, which probably doesn't make their citizens any happier. Operation Teutoburg commences, which knocks Greece out of the war by July 3rd using infiltration tactics. The Russian Civil War continues, with the Whites turning south from February to May to establish control over the Cossack heartland. The Entente slaps the Ottomans one more time, but the German stops them from invading Anatolia. To my Entente lovers, the, the Entente will be fine, but uh, g can you guys uh, leave for a second? Just just real quick? Okay. Are they, are they gone? Okay, good. Okay, so the Entente is fucked. Speaking of fucked, Lenin gets shot by Fanny Kaplan, which is essentially the death blow to the Reds. He is replaced by Lev Kavanev, but the Reds are still pretty shook. After that, the Germans, desperate for some of that Gewehrspekulatius, decide to assault the British in the Second Battle of Jutland, which, like all hockey matches, ends in a tie. The Royal Navy gets freaked out by this assault, and they're forced to end the blockade. That, plus new Ukrainian grain from the East, gives the Germans all the Gewehrspekulatius that they want. Then, the Kaiser of Austria-Hungary promises to give national self-determination for the different ethnic groups of the empire if they fight in the war. But of course, Hungary will be a nuisance later on. At the end of 1918, a Russian white admiral, Alexander Kolchak, became the dictator after a coup backed by the Brits. But he didn't become His Excellency, the benevolent, godlike, all-righteous Supreme Marshal, Admiral General, Commander President Alexander Vzilovich Kolchak. He instead just became the controller of the military. Starting 1919 with a big move by the Germans, with them launching a great offensive on the southern part of Verdun, and then a second attack on the Rhine, which not only split the Allied forces in two, but gave them an open road to Paris which they shortly put under siege thereafter. The Austrians accomplished something similar, starting Operation Radovitz. By attacking the Italians from the north instead of Piave, it caused the Italians to be surrounded by two Austrian armies, and gave the Austrians the ability to not only siege Venice, but to take the rest of Italy to the Italian armies being pinned. This caused a classic underdog story, with Ethiopia and the Dervish state taking Italy's eastern Africa African colonies, reversing European colonization for the first time. So, under the guise of the Herzog Foundation, I am giving Ethiopia and the Dervish states the esteemed award of You Defeated the Worst Army in Europe Award. Congrats.
Another surprising comeback to the horrible situation in France, the general that's the guy that's been screwing the Ottomans is forced to leave to France to help them out, and his successor somehow isn't able to defeat the sick man of Europe. The French, with the British evacuating, a second mutiny occurring, and the smell of red Soviet love in the air, the French capitulated on October 4th, leaving on top with only Britain, Japan, and Portugal. And if you haven't noticed, none of them can fight Germany, so the first major peace treaty signed is Versailles. Starting in the place where it all began, Austria gains oversight in all Serbian affairs, same with Albania, and Austria just outright annexes Montenegro. Sorry, Montenegro. Bulgaria takes Macedonia from Serbia, as well as Greek Macedonia and Salonika from Greece. Romania was weird. They ceded the Carpathia Mountain Passes to Hungary and the Dobruja to Bulgaria, but for some reason they gained land? They gained Bizarabia from the new land secured from Russia, and the Central Powers secured their economic interests in the country. Italy just collapsed outright. The only intervention into their land, which is now feuded by possibly thousands of duchies, was the independence of Libya, or Tripolitania? The, the, the names are different in game and on the wiki. I, I'm just going to go with Tripolitania because it sounds cooler. <clears throat> The only intervention into Italy's land was the independence of Tripolitania, with Ottoman protection, of course, and a demilitarized zone set up in the Republic of Venice as an Austrian buffer state. Jumping back to Brest-Litovsk in those lands, multiple puppet states were formed. Those puppet states were Lithuania, the United Baltic Duchy, which was the joint country of Estonia and Latvia, Poland and Finland were freed under German protection. Uh, by the way, Poland didn't get a German king or a king in general. Poland elected their king, so when they were given the chance to finally elect their king, they didn't get to it, and they don't get to it until 1936 when the game starts, so I won't be covering it. White Ruthenia or Belarus, as well as Ukraine, became the final countries to be free from Brest-Litovsk. France cedes a whole lot of southern African lands to Germany as well as Madagascar. France also cedes Indochina, their Pacific territories, and more Lorraine land to Germany. The Belgian Congo would be given to Germany, and the most industrialized area of Belgium as well. Belgium is reorganized into Flanders Wallonia. Luxembourg is outright annexed. A sort of semi-Cold War occurs in the sense of multiple proxy wars occurring in the Central Powers and the remainder of the Entente. Another strike occurs in France and the Republican administration of Georges Clemenceau was replaced by the provisional government of Aristide Briand. Meanwhile, in Russia, the two largest white fronts are united after capture of Tsaritsyn, and they proceed to defeat the Reds at Petrograd and siege the city. The two white fronts agree to unite their governments, where most of the preferences go to the Southern Whites Fair, like Alexander Kolchak being supreme commander of all the military and cutting ties with the Entente. Sergei Sazanov becomes prime minister, and Petrograd is finally taken. The Jacobins start a revolution in France to the Soviet inspiration. The French government flees to Algiers and create a provisional government. By the way, provisional governments become more and more popular in this timeline. Things in Italy get a little more interesting when the Republic of Italy was announced in Milan. Syndicalists in Torino, inspired by the French syndicalists who were inspired by the Russian Soviets, proclaimed the Socialist Republic of Italy, starring the Italian Civil War. To line things up a bit before 1920 rolls around, the Great the greatest man in history, Baron von Ungern Strunberg, proclaimed the new nation of Mongolia. 1920 starts off with a big one, the Bolshevik surrender. In America, William McAdoo is elected president. The Italian Civil War comes to a close, with these five nations coming out of it. Sardinia? the Papal State, the Socialist Republic of Italy, the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, and the Republic of Italy. The only exciting thing that happened in 1921 occurs when the Peace with Honor is signed, which puts an end to the Weltkrieg. All the rest of the Entente has to do is recognize the Treaty of Versailles. Now, these next events up to 1925 are minor, so we're not going to go in-depth in them a lot. The Austrian Kaiser decides to go with National Self-Determination Plan with the Empire. Also, bad news for all you Democrats out 
involved there because Franklin Delano Roosevelt succumbs to polio. After five years of fighting, the Irish Free State is established. A coup occurs in Portugal restoring the monarchy. Ludendorff is linked to a mass embezzlement of funds, so he's removed from post, ending the military control of German politics. Grand Admiral von Tirpitz becomes the Chancellor. This results in a German political golden age. Apparently, syndicalism spreads into the most unlikely places because the Australians briefly declare the Melbourne Commune, but George V suppresses it. Going back to the US, President McAdoo is re-elected. Going to the opposite of the US, an attempt to coup of conservative centrists occur in Russia, but fails. And since Alexander Kolchak was declared dictator, even though he's barely involved with the plot, he is forced to move to eastern Siberia to set up an Anglo-Japanese supported pretender state called Transamer. The Cossacks, seeing an opportunity, decide to declare independence from Russia. Going back down under, Australia and New Zealand merge into the dominion of Australasia. We're going to end this video off with a cliffhanger. Britain decides that some coal tariffs would be good. They weren't. Because a strike about them somehow evolved into a full-scale revolution. Yeah, weren't expecting that one. The royal family flees to Canada, and John McLean is elected the leader of the Union of Britain. What happens to the colonies? Find out next week when part 2 comes out. Thanks for watching, and see you later. Thank you.